welcome to the Intuitive Insights podcast series. I'm Nina Lockwood, founder and director of Intuitive Interim and Executive Search. Throughout this series, I will be sharing engaging conversations with talented leaders from across the UK transport sector. Today, I'm delighted to welcome George Davis, the Director for Sustainable Development at the Rail Safety and Standards Board, the RSSB. George talks us through his career to date Um, from the starting point of a degree in environmental science at the University of Leeds, through his career in aviation and for his last couple of years in the rail industry. I really hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did. Thank you for joining us. George Davis, Director of Sustainable Development for RSSB. It is an absolute pleasure to meet you and to bring you as a guest onto the Intuitive Insights podcast. I'm really looking forward to hearing more about your role. I think it's fair to say over the last few years, the word sustainable and sustainability is being used on an increasing frequency, perhaps still not increasing frequency enough, but we'll we'll come on to that, I'm sure. Um, But really warm welcome to today's podcast it's really lovely to see you thank you nina really great to be here and uh, looking forward to our conversation we'll start off in time honored fashion um i'd love to hear your story um this is one of the great privileges i have not only in the job that i do but as a as hosting in terms of this podcast is that i get to indulge my interest in people and their stories and their careers i'd like you to take us right back to the beginning please in terms of the decision you've made in terms of your career focus where you've been what you've done and how you've ended up in the role that you're doing today yeah, very happy to, to talk you through that. So um, I actually grew up in a, a pretty rural part of the country. It's where I am now, actually. I moved back here as a result of um, changes in uh, in my personal and professional life during the uh, COVID pandemic. So I'm, I'm in Herefordshire, where I uh, started out, born in Hereford in 1980. Um, and my father was uh, a racehorse trainer. So um, I've always had uh, horses in my, in my life, uh, albeit less engaged and involved with horses um, these days than I was as a, as a kid, but um, they're very much part of, uh, of of the sort of the background of, of my family. So um, yeah, uh, uh, a rural setting. Um, I'm often out helping my brother on his farm. So really, really connected to the natural world ever since, you know, I was, uh, I was a tiny, tiny little one, really. And that really set me um, up for a career in uh, in environmental um, protection, environmental science, and ultimately where we are now in, in the world of sustainability. So my my uh, education followed uh, a fairly sort of predictable path, really, in the in the context of um, uh, local local primary school, high school, um, and then I went off to do my A levels and specialised in in sciences. So I did biology and geography as my majors, and uh, and also uh, environmental literature and uh, language, which wasn't necessarily my strength, but it was something I enjoyed. Uh, and then off to university, and I did uh, environmental biogeoscience, it was called at Leeds. Um, and that really got me into the world of uh, environmental protection, environmental management. And I took some law modules because uh, recognising that, you know, business, you know, in the in the in the late 90s, early 2000s was uh, expected to be doing much more uh, in, in relation to protecting the environment. And that really got my um, got my juices flowing, really got my passion for protecting, as I say, the um, uh, the world out there. I'd also travelled a fair bit. I went out to um, Southern Africa and I got to see some of those parts of the world uh, in in Asia as well as in South America where um, there was a lot of poverty and a lot of people trying to improve their lot, um, but not necessarily doing so in such a way that we are able to do now in the developed world in in terms of protecting the environment. So that gave me a really good, um, uh, I guess, backdop to a career as I've I've built um, to, to date. So following university in Leeds, I went to join the Environment Agency and they uh, really trained uh, very well the intakes of environment officers that I was part of. So I became a warranted officer, effectively a police police person for uh, for the environment. I had uh, actually had powers of entry. I could go into any location uh, aside from a domestic premises, but I could go into any location without needing a court warrant if I thought there was something going on that shouldn't be. So I was... Um, regulating landfill sites. I was doing all the glamorous uh, work behind the scenes, uh, <laughs> to make sure that the landfills were compliant with their permits. Uh, I was also investigating things like fly tipping, and, and was quite driven actually to to catching um, catching those people who were breaking the law. Um, 
and a number of uh, major incidents I was involved with, um, which um, obviously were were hugely damaging to the local environment where they happened. But it was um, really affirming for me to be able to, you know, take action and, and bring obviously bring those people who were who were causing the problem to um, to justice, so to speak. So that was a really important part of my career, mm-hmm. and I got to learn about you know who who not necessarily individually, but you know, who, who were the goodies and who weren't perhaps doing the right thing by the environment. So after the Environment Agency, I went to work for uh, an American HSE consultancy firm and I got into aviation. And that's really where my sort of career in transport became sort of um, a focus. So um, I was working for this American firm, uh, helping their European and um, and UK business operations. So um, making sure that their facilities on airports, major airports, as well as smaller regional airports were in compliance with all sorts of safety and environmental um, legislation. And that really um, aligned with my interest and and sort of personal uh, passion, really, for for aviation, for flight, for travel, as I've mentioned. So I was able to, um, yeah, to build a pretty successful career in in aviation. And uh, that led me to Heathrow. And Heathrow was where I spent uh, the major chunk of my career, actually, about uh, 12 years. Um, and whilst there, I was in a uh, technical standards uh, role and, and, and driving forward improvements across environmental um, protection and management, not just at Heathrow, actually, because back in the day, it was part of the BAA group. Um, so I used to work across um, those other airports that they had, so Stansted, Aberdeen, Glasgow, Edinburgh. Um, and then over the time at Heathrow, I, I took on the leadership of the environmental management team there, uh, working very closely with a whole host of engineers with those people who were running the airfield, but also looking after um, a significant aspect of, of the airport and any airport actually is, is the community relations side of things. Mm-hmm. So making sure that those um, those affected communities, whether it be in relation to noise or other impacts of the airport, those communities understood that we were working hard to improve and reduce the environmental effects of, of the airport. Um, and then uh, the last sort of phase of my time at Heathrow was um, was heavily engaged in the expansion programme. So um, pre-pandemic, you'll probably remember, um, the government at the time um, was uh, supportive of expanding Heathrow and, and adding a third runway. So I was leading a team doing what was probably going to be the biggest environmental impact assessment ever ever seen on a, uh, on a UK project. So we were pretty well down the line and, and very well advanced on, on developing the ideas, the master plan um, and uh, looking at the mitigations of, of the environmental effects of, the, of that sort of scheme. And then along came COVID and also a, uh, a legal challenge that the government um, failed to defend. I'll put it that way. Boris Johnson was um, was not a supporter of expansion, but um, the uh, the airport has has re uh, if you like, reestablished the national policy statement for expansion. But obviously, post covid uh, the business case is is um, is is not as strong as it was, um, but I would expect to see that sort of thing come back again at some stage in the not too distant future. Um, but on on the I guess the, the career level, COVID um, as it has affected so many thousands of people in transport, particularly aviation, um, affected my my uh, prospects in that you know the expansion programs I've said was um, was brought to a halt. So. Um, one door closes and another door opens, so to speak. And I was really pleased to have the opportunity to uh, join the Rail Safety and Standards Board in um, in late 2020. Um, I could have stayed on at Heathrow, but actually in those days, it was a very much, uh, very minimal um, airport operation in comparison to ha- had it been before the, the, the COVID uh, incident sort of took, took hold. Um, so here I am at Rail Safety and Standards Board, been here over two years, doing some really interesting work with uh, a very talented team that I've been very, very lucky to build over the last couple of years. And we're doing um, uh, a series of, 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 of projects across environmental emissions, so carbon, air quality, noise, as well as natural environmental work, supporting the industry on improving biodiversity, addressing uh, waste and recycling, circular economy, water resources, uh, and also on the social side. So we're, we're not just focusing in on mitigating what I would describe as negative we're also keen on doing what uh, whatever we can and I know you and the intuitive team have been talking to my colleagues about social benefits that the railway brings and improving quality of life so um, a really exciting agenda Um, really uh, pleased to be well engaged and and very well supported by a whole range of colleagues from around the um, the, the, the industry Um, and yeah looking forward to pushing on and and helping our railway um, stay ahead of um, other modes you know we've got a brilliant brilliant position and we should really be 
uh, taking advantage of that inherent sustainability of our of our industry and um, as I say staying ahead of, of the competition. Yeah very much so I think there's what it feels to me like is that that we've got um, we've got a real opportunity ahead of us. Um, I think that I don't keep it I, this isn't a secret that I'd, I'm very passionate about the rail industry I think it's an amazing sector I've worked in many others um, throughout the consultancy part of my career and and I've never ever come across a workforce that is so passionate about what it does and the number of people that I speak to when I, I say to them so why the rail industry why did you why why do you work here and so many people and um, there are kind of two main themes is well it was an accident. I kind of came in by accident. And I, you know, I remember somebody saying to me, I came in, I came in on an eight week contract and I'm still here 25 years later. Um, so it's one of those industries that gets hold of you. So two themes. One is it was kind of by accident. But secondly, is that um, it's about making a difference. It's yeah. about being part of the economy, about being part of society, about supporting people, getting to work, to family, to friends, etc. I do think that that we could take we could make more of that. I think that the the difference in terms of um, the environmental impact of traveling by train, I think we could as an industry make more of that. Yeah, yeah. I'm really interested to know, having done, as you say, kind of 12 years ish at Heathrow and before that worked with aviation clients as part of your consultancy career and then now having spent two years in the rail industry, what are the main differences George that that you could say between aviation and I'm sure there are loads but in terms of of your your impressions are we any better at anything are we, how, what can we learn what can we learn yeah it's a question I've been asked a few times as you'd expect it's um uh it's really helpful actually to draw comparisons because there's a lot of similarities you know we're uh in the railway in, in the same basic industry we need to be moving people and goods uh to open those opportunities that you describe whether they be business opportunities or also uh, bringing people together to connect with family and friends as well so there's a huge similarity there i think the the rail industry's obviously got that inherent um advantage um because of the um the extensive electrification already you know the railway is largely not largely is is, is probably about 40 percent electrified and there's more opportunity to do that but it is um, it is ahead uh, in terms of that basic sort of proposition. Um, but in terms of what I think aviation is is maybe uh, leading on is is the ability to innovate and and the commercial drivers that obviously aviation has the the way in which the industry has over sort of the last 20, 30 years um, uh, has has really changed in in the way that we all now recognise. The low cost carriers and the way in which that model has has mm. brought aviation to a lot of a lot of people that wouldn't necessarily have been able to afford to fly in in years gone by and that's a hugely important thing mm. it's also questionable and and, and you can argue uh, about the environmental effects of that and and, and how that should be uh, reconciled um and i think what we should be doing in in rail is, is learning from that innovation and making sure that we use as we tried to do at heathrow over those years i was there use the capacity available to us to its maximum you know don't don't waste train paths make sure we've got a a system that is as huge you know as it is and as, as expansive as it is um making sure that it's optimized you know making sure that we do put the right uh trains in the right locations at the right time to serve the demand and obviously we're you know we're, we're going through um maybe sort of towards the end now of a, of a major change as a result of of covid and work patterns and the commuting Obviously, commuting um, frequencies are a lot different to what they were, um, but that brings opportunity. And we've got, a, as I say, a system um, with 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 capacity that really needs to be maximised. Mm. I think if you look at what aviation does, not just at Heathrow, at, at nearly all airports, um, they are very focused on um, getting as huge you know, efficiencies as possible and, and filling airplanes. You know, load yeah. factors as they are. You yeah. know, the, you struggle to get on an airplane today. And, and see very few spare seats. So selling those tickets and getting as much um, efficiency from that operation as you can, I think is 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 again a model that we should be trying to pursue. And, and we're seeing it in the industry. Don't get me wrong; it's not like it's absent, um, but we could do more of that. Yeah, I'm interested in the um, the innovation piece on this, and and this probably is quite timely because 
I received an email um, asking me to contribute to a, um, a pulse survey that the Railway Industry Association are doing around innovation. Yeah. So it really caused me to think because some of the questions um, you, you kind of you answer them as a as a yes, very a lot or in the middle or not very much. But then you have to quantify your qualify your answer. So I've been thinking a lot about innovation just in the last 24 hours. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm interested to know your thoughts in relation to the aviation industry being somewhere that, that has been innovative. How do we create or how do we improve the opportunity to innovate in the rail industry? Because I think there are a a few blockers. Have we got the right environment for people to feel that they can innovate? Mm. And is there an appetite for innovation in your experience? Yeah, I think the appetite is is certainly there. There are, though, um, there are blockers, whether they be institutional or um, legislative. Um, And I was really encouraged, actually, when when the plan for rail um, came out, um, it's already two years old, though, as we know. But when the rail, uh, the plan for rail came out, there was quite a, a few sentiments in there around unleashing the power of the private sector, and I think that is something absolutely that has to form an increasing part of the way the industry operates going forward. Because um, let's face it, you know, our country and, and the economic outlook for um, investment in rail from government is is going to be very limited. Um, so we need to be thinking about where could investment come from elsewhere? How do we bring those private investors in on the right terms um, to to drive innovation and, and, and to bring a different mindset? Um, we've seen some really exciting, I think, developments in the tech sector. Um, and how do we harness that tech um, uh, to promote, to market, to make our rail service attractive? Mm. Uh, and let's you know be honest you know pe- people don't really mind what type of transport they use as long as it's efficient affordable um and and reliable and so you know we've got to make sure that rail can play a really important you know integral part in a future mobility service um and, and we're seeing obviously the you know the development albeit um fairly you know steady and has to be regulated of of autonomous vehicles and mm. Uh, and, and the way in which you know we we are changing our minds around how we choose to move around the country. Um, clearly, rail doesn't reach every town or every dwelling, every city uh, it is served. So, intercity, uh, interregional, you know, rail should be absolutely the number one option. Um, so, yeah, there's there's plenty we should be um, creating there in terms of that um, new new ways of promoting platforming if you like the the railway yeah to to, to consumers uh it has to be an attractive choice yeah i think the, the one of the things that you mentioned earlier as part of your role at heathrow was around community relations and then this this kind of has mm-hmm. a knock-on thing in my head that says that that engagement with the community um is is so critical and i think yeah. there's been some brilliant examples that community rail partnerships are doing where they are bringing that feeling back, not everywhere, there is, it's still in pockets of the network, where the, the the railway station would be the heart of the community, the bit where, where people would know to go to. Um, and, you know, I think we're, we're probably still away from having destination stations. Um, you know, that's what I would refer to as St Pancras, for example. I think I've only ever caught one train from St Pancras, but I go there a lot because uh-huh. it's such a fabulous station. We yeah. can't do that everywhere. But that kind of the, the engagement with the community, which then kind of is is taking me into another question I have around sustainability, because if I think of the word sustainability, I'm all, I'm into climate change. My head goes to, um, you know, kind of the environment. But increasingly, I'm hearing talk, people talk, and you've mentioned it yourself this morning, in terms of that social side Absolutely. of sustainability. So how do you see the rail industry impacting on that? How do we how do we do that that piece? Well, I think you're, you're absolutely right in the context of, of, of stations as places and um, developing the the immediate area around a station so that it is attractive and and, and not just a, a, a point of access and egress to 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 travel. 
Um, and there are some brilliant examples out there of, of, of where the stations are becoming much more of a community facility. And there's obviously ranges of, um, of ways of doing that. But we should really be encouraging the local authority to think about that that hub, that um, that destination. You may go to the train station um, and and see you know see a health professional, for instance. We know that we've got an aging population, so in the future, giving people more convenient access to health services, I think, is going to be a big part of um, of, of not just rail, but 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 our societies and, and community offers. And you're right. I mean, the 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 environmental sort of um, movement has done a really good job at, at, at highlighting the the effects of of, of climate change, and, and we just had the hottest June on record, mm. um, um, which, which is alarming. And we've clearly got to be focused hard on addressing that. But if you talk to a railway professional about what they need to do at twenty fifty or by twenty fifty, they'll be thinking about ten to nine this evening because they're operationally focused. So um, we, you know, we, we've got to help make the uh, the offer of um, of what the railway can do in the locality real today. Mm. Um, and you know there's there's so many choices that we can um that we can make better in my view if we look outwards from our stations into the communities around us and make sure that there are facilities whether, whether they be health facilities or childcare facilities uh retail obviously is a big part of um of the attraction mm. so and, and i encourage local authorities wherever possible to to work with network rail to work with the train operating companies as I know it is it is happening in some locations. Mm. Um, but to the point I made earlier on about, you know, the, the, the private sector piece, I think the you know, the way in which some parkway stations have been developed, whether they be on the Chiltern line or near where I am on, on Great Western, it was a really impressive development that have seen a future um, connecting new or existing developments to um, to the rail network. So mm. that's the sort of thing I'm I'm really pleased to see. So Worcestershire Parkway is a prime example, the station I use a lot, um, and over the next few years, we know that that area around Worcester, alongside the M5 there, is going to be developed. Um, but what we've done with the railway developing the station there is provided a sustainable choice for people to get to and from London, to and from Birmingham, mm. and to and from South Wales and um, and the West Country, which is which is fantastic for that part yeah. of Worcester. Yeah, there are some great pieces of work being done really great and I'm in a, a, a privileged position because I, I am a, a judge for the National Rail Awards mm -hmm. and we've just finished in the middle of June we always do the due diligence meetings I sit on two panels one is outstanding teamwork and the other is outstanding personal contribution so I spend literally four days every year listening to, to some examples of the great stuff that's being done out and about on the network um, and it's it's so inspiring there's some fantastic stuff being done um, and it's and it's great you, you know got some great examples that you've just shared there it's that idea of let's let's spread the word let's yeah. let, let's kind of recognize what's being done especially around the stations the community engagement and that whole social value piece which seems to be becoming increasingly well I think it's always been important but there's an increasing awareness of the importance of it um, so I'm hoping I've not stolen any of your thunder here because we're kind of getting into some detail in relation to how the railway could do things differently um, in, in terms of this heading under sustainable development. One of the um, one of the questions that I ask my guests on the Intuitive Insights podcast is um, around your three wishes in terms of the industry moving forward. Where are the opportunities? What can we do differently? And if if I was to get my magic wand out and say, right, George, I'm going to grant you three wishes for what we could do differently, better, more of in the rail industry. What would those three key areas of priority be for you with your hat on in terms of director of sustainable development? Yeah, brilliant. Um, a brilliant prompt to, um, uh, yeah, to, to sort of showcase a few thoughts. I think. The, the, the railway has gone through a very difficult time, no getting away from that. And we've still got some some major challenges, but there is a bright future ahead. And I think we should be really uh, confident and assertive of that positive contribution the railway is making today, but also can make in the future. Um, so I think there's there's a, a definite wish around making sure that we are um, promoting and and demonstrating the value of rail, not the cost of rail. And you know we 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 should be pushing back against this 
um, you know, there's criticism from some corners where rail you know, is, is heavily subsidised and why should it have the funding it has? Whereas actually that, in my mind, is, uh, is investment in communities. That's investment in jobs, careers, not just jobs, actually. These are um, uh, brilliant opportunities throughout our network for, for people to come and, and, and develop their skills to, to, to run the railway in the future. And, and you know, there's many, many thousands of different uh, types of roles out there. So I think there's that that point around um around perception and adjusting the narrative, which I think has been a little bit too too negative of late. Yeah. I think there's something definitely in the world of um of, of rail along with road, along with aviation, and making sure that we are again, you know, placing rail in the in in the leadership role it should take for intercity, affordable, reliable transport now clearly that the railway has to run well and and we've got to do the brilliant basics to make that the case but um we've got to make sure that people don't choose to fly domestically when there's a viable rail option uh, and i think what the team have done at lumo and martin and and, and the group around him there have, have done some brilliant disruptive innovative things to bring that open access operation to to serve london to edinburgh uh, and a good luck with you know with with others that are following i know there's um other routes from southern wales and, and also scotland coming coming in uh, hopefully in the near future so that sort of thing will help to give more options um so uh perception of rail is a leveling of the playing field um and, and i think we've got a huge opportunity now with reform and i spend a, a fair bit of time uh, along with the great, great british railways transition team and, and helping to think uh, shape some of their thinking and and, and open perhaps a, a few different ideas uh with them and so I'm thinking, you know, we we are looking at a guiding mind for the railway, um, but it should be a guiding mind that's a very collaborative mind with other modes, um, because let's face it, you know, the road sector has a very significant challenge, a very similar challenge to us. Mm. So where could we work much more um, integrated with road? Where could we work more integrated with active travel uh, and particularly um, other types of of, of um of, of public transport you know serving serving the network where the railway doesn't reach and that comes back to the point i made earlier on around around technology so there are three wishes in there somewhere nina but um hopefully that's given you yeah, a flag where i'm it, thinking it's definitely music to my ears because that whole kind of piece around promoting and demonstrating the value of rail and doing what we can do to change the perception the outside mm-hmm. perspective if you like um, I think that, and I, I've been quoted a number of times just recently as as saying, and I will keep banging on about it, it's the best kept secret in terms of, of an industry sector that is exciting. It, it is innovative. It is ambitious. It's It's a brilliant place to work, but we don't tell enough people about it. And whilst we're very good amongst ourselves at saying, well, we've done this well and that's going well and look at this piece of work, mm. um, we could do more in terms of, of pushing that out and, and working to change that perception. And I, I think a key word that you've, that you've used there, which is kind of looking at this as an investment rather than a cost. And I absolutely know that there'll be people listening to this who are kind of, yeah, it's but it's it's HMT that that are focused on that. It's it's not us as an industry that's focused, but the behavior from government is not helping in terms yeah. of um that perception. Well, it's yeah, it just costs us a lot of money as a taxpayer, and what value do I get out of it? And et cetera, et cetera. It's changing that narrative, and that is, I I fear, quite a long journey, but one which if we're all pointing in the same direction, then we've got a better chance of achieving. Um, so I think some some really positive stuff there. Um, and something which is really, really interesting to me, because it doesn't come up very often, is this collaborative approach. We're very good at collaborating in in rail. Mm. But I'd, I'd love to hear about stuff that's happening outside of that in terms of, yes, I know that there's some stuff happens with bus, and and maybe because we've got train stations at, at airports, maybe there's some stuff going on with aviation. But the, but roads, oh, 
So how does that work? How's that Mm -hmm. happening? The active travel piece. I'm speaking to more and more people who are are involved in that and involved in promoting that. Um, So some really good food for thought there in terms of of how we could do things differently. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's, uh, I think, great leadership coming out of of the devolved nations in in Wales and, and also in Scotland. But I think the Welsh in particular, they're taking a very hard look at their road building and road development um, uh, pipeline and making sure that they're only taking really forward those schemes where they can be justified, both on a social and, and environmental carbon level. Um, and they're investing heavily in their railways and they're building new stations and they're electrifying the Core Valley lines. And I think that's obviously a, a smaller scale, but a very important mm. um, uh, for the future of Wales, you know, a very important set of developments. And I think, you know, that's going to prove uh, to be very, very sage and, and wise, wise decision making. Mm. Um, you know, we've got opportunities to do similar elsewhere in, in the country, both in England, and obviously up in Scotland, there's there's progress. Um, but we've got to be able to make the case, you know, we're in a challenging economic situation, to say the least. Um, and, you know, with HMT, ultimately, uh, holding a fair amount of the, uh, the influence over what, what's you know what's spent and where it's invested you know we've got to make the best case um and we should be doing that i think in a collaborative way and not competing with um with road particularly um and also justifying investments in um in in making sure our railway is accessible because um it isn't often the most accessible choice um and there are benefits of having city center rail stations and there's also disbenefits of having those because of where they are in terms of access so yeah so much that we could um that we could go and uh lots and to do. into the detail yeah yeah lots to do and you and your team have put together um a plan haven't you recently the, the sustainable rail strategy that's right and, and so kind of a, a a guidance if you like for the industry and you've worked with the industry to put this together yeah. so so this is kind of right the plan moving forward um what what's how can we expect to see more of that george appearing yeah, around it, it, and about it's it's um uh it's pretty well concluded in terms of the development phase. It has been a co-creation exercise. So the sustainable rail blueprint, uh, as it's now known, we've um uh, we've developed the, the document. So it's about fifty or sixty pages of um uh, of really quite detailed in some parts um, guidance, as you say, in terms of suggesting where we need to take action and 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 proposing initiatives that, in some cases, are already underway and others um, should be picked up and progressed. Um, and I'm just concluding at the moment the um, the plan to launch the, the blueprint, uh, yeah. discussing that with the Department for Transport, who uh, who were very grateful for funding the initiative. But essentially, it's a comprehensive and credible plan for sustainability um, across across the railway, and it provides, uh, I think, what what many people have already told me is you know is is really useful guidance because um, it is a big, broad set of issues with yeah. often. Um, quite complicated and and and, and technically uh difficult sort of topics so we're here to provide that advice and um like we do across standards and and safety indeed the, the rail safety and standards board mm. um you know we, we are really keen to work forwards with members but also with the industry as a whole um so yeah we'll watch this space we're, we're really Brilliant. close now to uh, doing some promotion and, and launching that Fantastic. I shall. Uh, I shall make sure that I'm watching for it, and I shall promote it through through whichever channels I I can as well. Because I've um I've had sight of it. I've had sight of the the draft document. I've seen the one pager, which yeah. works for me. You know that, and I know that there will be people who will kind of scour through the document and pick out loads of amazing ideas and, and things that they can do. The one pager summary of it for me was just perfect because it kind of covers so much, but but so much amazing work being done. Um, and um, and I'd certainly like to support getting that getting that word out and getting that communication out. So we'll do what we can in our small way um, uh, to help. Yeah. Well, so thank you for the um, uh, the we absolutely. So the the uh, the traditional way to end these conversations is to talk about where you get your inspiration from. Now, some of our guests, that's a quote that they continually go back to. Um, I'm learning new ones all the time. It's just brilliant. I love it. Um, some people, it'll be a book that they've read. It could be a podcast they've listened to. It could be a person they've worked for. So. In, in answer to the question of what inspires you, what would your what would your answer be? Wow, um, 
I think it, it is about doing business in the right way. And that might sound a bit corny, but I've seen um, from my experience in the environment agency business done in a really bad way, mm. a way that really does not care for uh, protecting the environment and, and um, doing doing the right thing. So that, you know, that drives me making sure that we can improve uh, and the railway is already doing great things. But um, uh, in terms of, of a, of a quote, I'm in mean, a very personal level. I, 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 um, uh, I often think about a very straightforward statement, which is, you know, let go and do it, set the agenda and push on. And, and you know, it's not exactly a very profound. I'm not um, uh, yes. not quoting any anybody there other than other than myself, because I'm sure like many people who you speak to, um, you know, we we need to establish ourselves in in the careers and the roles we have and um, and moving forward with that confidence to to drive change you know that that's what really is something that i'm i'm conscious of mm. that i think the um the do it part is so critical isn't it it's we we can spend and i certainly don't think we're the only industry sector that does this but we can spend lots and lots of time on planning and talking about it and meeting about it to talk about it and to plan it a bit more but actually in order to drive change we've just got to get on and do it haven't we we have absolutely right because um at the end of the day you know we, we are in a really um privileged position to be able to drive that change and yeah. help people to um, make progress in their own different different realms and domains so yeah that's 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 crucial for me yeah perfect george davis director of sustainable sustainable development if i can say it um for the rssb it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you thank you for sharing your career story with us um i'm sure that people will have other questions because you've given us kind of little hints and and tips as we've gone through and there's so much more we'll look out for the launch of of the blueprint which will tell us um some more of the detail in terms of the plan moving forward um but i'm sure you'd be very open to people contacting if they want any further information for my part i've really enjoyed our conversation i'm really grateful to you for joining me on the virtual couch of the intuitive insights podcast thank you so much thank you dina yeah really enjoyed it myself too all the best my huge thanks to george for sharing his thoughts and his insights in terms of the opportunities ahead in the uk rail industry around the area of sustainability thanks so much for joining us please do drop me a comment with any feedback you have And um, if you feel like it, you could subscribe to the podcast. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.